Okay, so it's 12 o'clock noon time. Uh, I will kick off the session. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Pedro Ferreira. I'm one of the directors of Founders Institute in Frankfurt. And I would like to welcome you for this lunchtime series. We have been doing this, I think it's already our fourth time. Last month we did it with Thomas Ersberger. The topic was uh, growth hacking. Uh, but today we invited one great mentor to join us once again, Nelson Farfani Spada. Um, he was part of our first and second cohort. Um, and today we really want to, to hear from him. He has a huge experience working with uh, big Fortune 100 companies uh, like uh, Procter & Gamble, Brita, but as well he has been working a lot uh, with startups in different ecosystems, uh, especially in Taiwan with Brain Navi, for example. He will let us know more about it. But the idea here uh, and the main topic that he's covering are lessons that startups can learn from these 1400 companies. And at the same time, it's a bit of spoiler, I think he will do as well the opposite to, to showcase uh, some learnings that Fortune 100 companies can also take from startups. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping, the idea of the, um, this session uh, is really to, to, to last one hour and one hour only, uh, so that everyone is very engaged, so turn on your cameras. Uh, the agenda is the following, Nelson will start, he will have like 15-20 minutes to cover a keynote, uh, and the idea is that then um, I will do just a shortly uh, advertising space, also two, three minutes just to showcase what we are doing at F5 Frankfurt. But the idea then is to use the last half an hour for Q&As uh, about the topic that Nelson is sharing. So write down some questions um, because we want this to be interactive and for you as well to, to, to have a good use of this time. So with no further to say i would like to once again say thank you to nelson to joining us for joining us and you can take it from here nelson okay okay thank you so let me just uh do a small introduction let me go here to the zoom and i'm going to share my screen so the stop do the whole thing oh this one so you should see my screen, right? Got it? Yes, we do. Okay, well, first of all, thank you for everybody for coming. Uh, and I'll take a little, bit for, for a little bit about my introduction first. And I'm, what I'm gonna share today is gonna be actually the lessons I've learned at Fortune 100 companies that I can pass on to you guys. Yeah, and uh, there, there are many, many of them. So uh, my name is Nelson Fofana Spada and um, in my background, I, as you can imagine, as Pedro mentioned, was in many global leading roles at Fortune 100 companies, especially Oral-B, Procter & Gamble, Chile. These are the major brands, I think the uh, top world brands that you can, you probably all know. Uh, and also through my last five years, I have many clients like at DeLonghi, Kenwood, and, uh, and many others, right? But if you look to, to the center, the academics part is something that the last three years I've been asking more and more to go to like, uh, guest lectures at the HKUC in Hong Kong or in Taiwan or yeah, at Ebbs University in, in Germany. So this is something for me to share and I love to share my knowledge. Uh, this is something that I think uh, there's some experience that I've gained in the past and I'd love to pass it on. And on the very left, uh, left side, you see the startups. Uh, I have a lot of it's uh, quite some babies that I would say that I, that I uh, work with for, for years now and, and uh, for growth like uh, Brain Abbey or uh, Brace or Suvi is a new brand that we're launching just now and many other smaller ones. So this is basically a bit of my background that you can see where I'm coming from. Uh, we're based in Frankfurt. Uh, we are a strategic marketing and venture development uh, company. What we do basically is we develop strategies, we create brands, uh, we implement them uh, to, uh, to get ready for globalization. And last but not least, uh, either is the growth, but normally startups, they like to IPO at one point or they like to go through an M&A. So the whole journey is going from the uh, strategy development to your journey. So it's like, a like a guidance uh, to take you through from A to Z, right? And, uh, but also just to visualize here what we do, either we recover business performances, right? Or we strengthen the brands and presses where, where we have, or we take products and brands to leaderships. And I have a lot of cases that we've done that, let's say in, in, in non uh, FMCG uh, Fortune 100 companies, you know, I can show you some cases. 
And last but not least, also uh, M&As, also successfully done, to take him to the whole journey, which takes a long time. At least one example was the Leica, and it took about 10 years, exactly 10 years, from day one to the, uh, to the M&A with a big, large uh, multinational. So here's the team. Uh, on the left side, you see strategy and management. They got me, Petri Toibanen, and he's also present in the meeting. Uh, he's based in Finland and in charge for Europe and North America, a partner, uh, Pedro uh, Patricio, who came from Lilly and some of the companies in, in, in China, Sophie Song and based in Shanghai, that they cooperate with us. And also in Taiwan, uh, Jackie Lu and Lilly, and we did also some events here in Germany. Uh, we did the uh, innovation battle uh, in, in, in Frankfurt, it was in the biggest innovation congress. It was an amazing exercise. And we're planning to do one at the Epspreneurship. And uh, we're in the middle of planning. I hope it works because of COVID. But we do want to do an innovation battle, let's say, Epspreneurship with, uh, you know, with other universities uh, around the world. And you see the gentleman M&A, uh, Dr. Patrick Schmidl and Mr. Dirkus. Uh, they are the M&A gurus on the right side. Don't need to get into details, but all of, say, all of the innovation, industrial design, product design, IoT integration, basically coming out of Taiwan and so on. So uh, summarize everything, we do the strategy, development to globalize either for growth or m and okay? That's part of my introduction, so that you know who you're talking to. Um, so I'm gonna talk today about the lessons I've learned in federal owner companies and um, looking, for example, where I came from, uh, number two in consumer goods, this is Procter & Gamble, and, and rightly so, uh, for many uh, ways that they, they run the business. Um, but, I get so many, let's say, uh, pushback, you know, when I go out and talk to medium sized companies or startups and they say, well, we're not Procter & Gamble, we're not Gillette, we're not this, we're not gonna make, you know, of course you have a team, you can, of course you can do it. You know, yes and no. And what I, today, what I wanna do is, I, I want you to, in your mind to, to take out and ignore that uh, the first one of companies, they have a funds, they have a lot of money, yeah? The startups don't. They have all the channels globally. They have all the systems. They have IP rights. They have an army of lawyers. So ignore that because if we compare ourselves to that, then it's not going to be equal. So ignore that. Imagine you have the right funds. Imagine you have the right channels. You have an army of lawyers. You have everything in place. Okay. So I want to take that out and isolate because what I'm going to show you is something that anybody can do. Anybody can do, and why can a, a, a Fortune 100 company do it, and we can't, you know? So that's what I'm going to show you today. So um, at the end of the day, you know, like I said, go into M&A, or it's all about profitability and growth and so on. And uh, I'm going to show you a video from uh, Charlie Munger, which is uh, Waffer, um, Warren Buffett's best buddy, financial buddy for, I think, over like uh, 60, 50 years. They have continuous uh, return on investment about 20, 25%, amazing. And I did look at this because I thought, what is the end tunnel? What is the final purpose when you go out and pitch to an investor, right? Uh, and then they have an expectation from the financial side, but we need to do the homework. We need to do our stuff in order to achieve that, right? So I'm gonna show you this um, uh, video. I hope you can uh, hear it well. Okay, so there's... Uh, Charlie Munger. We have to deal in things that we're capable of understanding. And then once we're over that filter, we have to have a business with some intrinsic characteristics that give it a durable competitive advantage. And then, of course, we would vastly prefer a management of the place with a lot of integrity and talent. And finally, no matter how wonderful it is, it's not worth an infinite price. So we have to have a price that makes sense and gives a margin of safety considering the natural vicissitudes of life. That's a very simple set of ideas. And the reason... So uh, here, he's saying very simply, you know, it, I said from an investor perspective, A, he has to understand uh, has to be capable to understand the business. Second, they need to have an intrinsic um, sustainable competitive advantage, something that they can do better than nobody else, uh, that has a management with integrity and talent. And last but not least, you know, the, uh, the profitability part, right? And uh, taking that, let's say, as an introduction, I'll, I'll go down to the strategic marketing and, and part that, that, that we do and see how much synchronization to that uh, uh, 
uh, we can find. So um, I've, I've taken um, Charlie Munger's uh, four and I've adapted to, to, to my own. Uh, of course, I'm not Charlie Munger, you know, uh, but I just, uh, I do what I, what, I, what I do when I can. So first of all, uh, for pushing on the companies, one thing is the mindset. The mindset is so critical in order to, to, to win. And I'll show you a little, little bit about the mindset that they have. Um, but later, in the, if you have any questions there, you can, you know, contact me and then go a deep dive in a little bit because we only have 20 minutes. So we have to keep it a little bit um, tight. So then second, they're great at what they do. They, that Charlie Munger said they have, they, they have a, a intrinsic, they have something deep inside that they are uh, so strong at it, right? That makes them to have a sustainable competitive advantage. That's something that nobody else can have except for you, at least very difficult. Right. And if you took, to take any example, if you do those checks, uh, you know, it, it, it's quite interesting and quite, quite successful. And last but not least, he said, uh, this investor, he wants to invest or buy in something in a, on, a, on a good deal and something that is uh, that has all its all the fundamentals. But the way I look at it is um, you need to be profitable also in bad times. That's what the, the big companies are. Uh, and they're big ships. You cannot turn them so quick. But. Uh, if you don't have that, you may not be a Fortune 100, simply, right? And then, of course, there are more, but I'm focusing on the uh, on these four again. It's the mindset, uh, the greater what they do, they have, they do have a sustainable competitive advantage compared to competition. Uh, profitable, even in bad times, you got to have that. Otherwise, you know, you're gonna go hops uh, sooner or later, like you know, Kodak uh, could have been could have been one, but uh, they missed some of these uh, fundamentals. So um, about the, uh, I, I went and found a report from McKinsey saying that 83% of global CEOs say that marketing is a major driver of growth. And, um, you know, and of course 23 said no. Uh, but the thing is, those companies that actually have marketing as a major growth driver, they're the winner ones. They're the ones that win and the other ones not. So. And this is a mind change set. And when startups, uh, and normally you, you are in that direction, but you need to think how, how they work because in a lot of say it's medium or like following companies that follow, you know, second, third tier companies, that marketing could be just like a, like a supporting role. You know, oh, do the leaflet or now with the social media digital marketing, it becomes a bit more important, but it's really crucial just like IP, uh, globalization and financing investment. Uh, so all of that, so marketing is very, very important. So in uh, the experience that I've had, basically strategic marketing leads the organization. It is not a supporting role, it leads. It leads over engineering, IP, product design, innovation, everything, the whole, the whole organization. You know? It's not a service department, but always keep in mind that Yes, all the R&D teams and, 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 and the, they do have their areas of, of competence to, to go in different areas because if you would have a strategy, things go all over the place. So you need to have that. Uh, and uh, companies that have this, uh, of course, they're, and if you look at the, uh, what, what McKinsey has uh, proven also that, and you see the numbers, uh, these are the successful companies. And marketing means not only consumer goods, right? It's B2B and B2C. So show you a little bit about uh, for example, comparing, you know, there uh, you, you have to be consumer centric compared to Salesforce centric. That, that's a big difference, you know, to, um, and I've seen again and again, uh, and many, let's say smaller companies, it's about the next sale, the next, next thing that's going to happen. And then this is just a business that's going to come in and out. And it's not going to be really uh, sustainable. The, 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 the segments have to be very narrow compared to everybody. How many times you heard about a product? Oh, it's for everybody. It's good for everybody. No, it can't be for good for anybody. It just you got to be really targeted. Uh, then you have to buy, you have to build a sustainable franchise compared to like a episodic business jumping in and out, in and out. Uh, you know, I love nowadays the uh, the trial and error mentality. But uh, wh why would you want to do a lot of trial and error, right? And be proud about it if you can do your homework. So at least to increase your chance to win by doing your homework and not just trialing and erring. So that is something that is very important that uh, imagine you're a big, large corporation, you have billions of funding and you do a trial and error. I think that's gonna be a big challenge. Then of course, end user insight generation compared to I think I like, my wife said, my girlfriend said, and I hear this many times, it's not just a, a me saying out of the blue, 
Uh, and whenever I hear this from either from partners or clients, I say, it doesn't matter if you like it or not. It's about what the consumers are saying, what the customers are needing and wanting. That's very, very difficult to, to step out of it and really accept, right? Uh, then it's a brand, uh, brand uh, is a, or service experience rather than a project or, or, or a product. Uh, very keen all, always to the, uh, to the experience that we have with, the, uh, with our users. And talking about benefits, emotional bonding compared to futures and specs. And, you know, I have 10,000. So yeah, the next one's going to come with 15,000. What are you going to do? So always keeping in mind that whenever we communicate, we're talking with humans. Uh, and, and overall robots and we humans we have emotions uh if we're talking ai uh, learning machine learning okay then you know you can skip all that what i'm talking about but if anything you're going to be working with and talking to a human being then you need to go through the process and have your right communication anyway so point number two that i'm going to talk about is they, they, they're great at what they do and they have methods they have the tools they have the systems and what I'm going to show you is, is, is a method that I that is actually all FMTG, all the big ones, they have it in one form or another. What I've done is I've taken and adapted so it can be utilized by small companies and startups, right? So in this method, I'm going to show you uh, is a framework and always have to keep in mind that you need to have a helicopter view and a boat view. And a helicopter view always, you know, you know what it means, 30,000 feet, you look up high and you you look around what the situation is, and if you're the boat's view, you basically cannot see much of the horizon. So uh, you always need to know that this, this view is very important and it should be done in a cycle. Like, you know, in uh, uh, big corporations, there are cycles, there are the budget, mid quarter reviews, long term plans. So there's be always reviewing, you know, going up and down, up and down, up and down, which is very, very critical. And of course, it's uh, sometimes challenging if you're in the startup phase where, like, you know, either trying to survive, trying to make the next, uh, next month. Right, but it's always good to go up and down. So this is going to help you. Now, this uh, strategic framework that I that I developed is uh, basically you can just think of as just four buckets, right? Four simple buckets, and everything you've learned, you can throw it in these buckets. And you'll see afterwards. And I'm not going to go into detail because you probably even know some of most of these things, right? But I just want to simplify. Like like Charlie, he said, very simple four things. Same here. You either look at your why, which is your analysis part, uh, on the on the who it is. Uh, Who's your target? Uh, who are you going to go after? What is your product, your service? And then how are you going to do it? And it's a circle that goes around. It should, should be a continuous circle. So uh, like I said, in my experience, uh, talking especially with uh, follow companies that are, that are following followers, you know, they get straight into the how. You know, so if some of you guys are excited to get the things done, uh, and I've quote my son, he, uh, he, had, he has his own startup, uh, you know, and uh, that's, if you see it here, you know, He's a doer, you know, he's 20, started with 22, but I always try to bring him back to think back. And then after a while, he could come back and say, wait, what about that analysis part, right? Actually, it should be 80%. 80% should be done. And what I'm calling this is doing your homework. Doing your homework before so you have a higher chance of succeeding rather than trial and error. Because if you don't do trial and error, you can do that. That's fine. You know, but you can do a lot of trial and error. So why not to do uh, your homework a little bit more? So the method I'm going to show you is, uh, if you look on the right to the left, uh, it could, you could use it, for example, I'm using for robotic surgery, uh, Brain Navi in Taiwan. Uh, you could use, I used it also for Oral-B, you know, to become a world-leading uh, brand and then and, and battery toothbrush segment. Uh, at Merce Pharmaceuticals for Boca Trio, we were able to uh, beat Botox in many, many countries. And today is a world-leading brand in aesthetics or just beauty. So it, it's the system and it can be used for, for all, for, for all kinds of categories and businesses, B2B or B2C. Um, the system is global from a global perspective. You can have a, a develop your whole strategy or your brand or your communication on a global, but also on a local level, right? On a global level. So it, it's, it, you need to adjust it. So it's never one or the other. It's always like a balance where you're going to end up with the method I'm going to show you. So here's some examples, uh, some uh, executions of. Um, of the past that, that I've lived, for example, top left, HKUSD and uh, university in Hong Kong, they wanted to have higher quality of students, or you go to the uh, very right, the surgery, brain surgery, or Leica, uh, water filtration. I would like, we have an amazing case I'd like to show one day, uh, is the only brand in the world that was actually be able to breed the world, uh, world leader, right? 
and being being a small company. So I go into the, um, my time is almost out. I'm almost done. So just think about why. In the why, you basically go out and look at everything and you analyze for different angles. You look at your category, competition, consumers. Uh, you look at, you know, what, what about your placement? Where, what about your conversion rates? What about your SWAT? If you, have, if you love to do BCG or uh, just take everything you have. And then the more you look at it from different angles, the better it will be. But you need, you need to have a, uh, decision criteria and then you conclude some implications. When you go through this exercises in different filters, you will sort of like see which direction we'll be going to very, very clearly. Uh, and again, this is this takes a long time to go through all of this, but just the idea to give you is uh, take all the analysis tools you have, put them in there. And of course, I'm going to share this uh, with everybody. It's not just like a checklist uh, to do your analysis part, the why. And then when you get in, and oh, by the way, I, I saved this for you. Uh, this is um, a competitive analysis, which is one of them, a really very uh, amazing tool because you, you look at competitive competition because you want to find a sustainable competitive advantage, right? So, so you look what you inferior the competition. What are you the same like competition? What are you different? What are you superior? Then you have your squat. They have many, let's say, different angles and it will crystallize some areas, for example, that you're inferior there, you need to then you need to make it get better. If you're superior, then you need to ask the next question. Okay, do I have a sustainable competitive advantage? Is that something that nobody else can do better than you? And then, of course, the question to secure that, what is the source of competitive advantage? Where is it coming from? Is that that intrinsic way of, of, of working, the knowledge, uh, the deep knowledge of your product or your service? So that is something that I, I wanted to show this, just these two slides of the tools, just to give you the idea. I know to go through a process how to be how, how to get your sustainable competitive advantage. If you go to the target group, most of you know today uh, finally and then and, and so in digital marketing and Google Ads, they've applied to this system, which actually this is old. Okay, this old school now with a with a uh, with a Google uh, campaigns and everything. It's been refreshed with sometimes different wording, but the idea is the same. It hasn't been reinvented. So uh, digital marketing base is coming from old school. Um, anyway, so you're looking at your consumers, you look at all the behaviors, or what are the psychographics. This is the more important to the left. And influencers, of course, this is something that we, in the old days, we tried to get some influencers, but it was very difficult. Now it's a luxury to be able to have that and the demographics. But now here you keep in mind that when you do your, your, your digital marketing, your campaigns, always try to deep, get yourself deep into the consumer's feelings and understand and what's your strategy to move them from, from, from today to tomorrow? Where do you want them to go? What is the, your brand compared to company? What are these emotional links that, that you have and how are you gonna bring your life, especially if you're not gonna only be online, online only. Then we say, what? What are you gonna, what's your offering? Very simple, you know the four Ps. Everybody knows the four Ps, right? Raise your hands, everybody knows it. Yeah, product, price, placement, promotion. That's where it goes. And then on the, pro, it could be a product or a service, then you need to look at your, your marketing mix. What is, what, what is your marketing mix? Where are, you going to be, where are you going to be seen? And what is the priority within the marketing mix? Then your communication strategy. Now here, the communication strategy is not your positioning statement. It's something that you're going to say about your communication that is more global, more sustainable, more long-term. And then your campaigns that, go, that goes beyond in, in, the, in, the, in the execution part. And you need your DNA, right? <clears throat> your DNA, what is the company all about? All the, all, the, all, the, all the equities that you have. And that's what Charlie Munger was saying. You know, they want to have a company that with, with a strong DNA that has a sustainable competitive advantage. <clears throat> Sorry. And then if you look at the how, finally bring it to life. Uh, yes, then you can start going, now, now is the time to play. And everybody loves to do that. Now you can hire uh, creative agencies and so on. And uh, you need to communicate those in words. Yeah, and senses. Sorry, I have a dog, he's barking. Anyway, so the senses, very, very critical. I mean, normally life, I would ask how many senses uh, do we have? Normally I get an answer is uh, five, but actually the heart, the emotion, that's otherwise would be like machine learning, right? We need to, we have our emotions and if we get that communication and that is for B2B or B2C, I mean, if you can Google it, say emotional decisions, you can find 93% uh, engineer, doctors, prophet, they will make at one point an emotion, emotional decision. Uh, so if you get that right, then you have a better chance to, to succeed. You know, provided you've done your homework before. Then you look at your experience, how, how are we gonna experience, what are you gonna smell, what are you gonna, what are you gonna be touched, like how, 
uh, if it's a B2B product, how, how, what is that interaction that you're gonna have with them, right? And your channels. So that is uh, basically the, um, the, the two, four areas. And this is another tool I wanted to share with you. You can take a look at the video later. That's uh, um, this is Port and Gamble's uh, system. Mine is a little bit adapted, uh, but basically it's, uh, you have your, in one piece of paper, your vision, your mission, your objectives and words and the numbers and your core strategies, right? And the core strategies, then you have your metrics. For each strategy, you have a metric and your activation plan. So you can have it in a, in a, in a, in a, in a small um, DNA4 paper. Uh, and this uh, strategic document that you come out, out of the whole thing should be sustainable and it should stay for, let's say, uh, for a long time. I have some, uh, looked at some old strategic uh, blueprints years afterwards, and there's just very small adjustments to be done. Then, of course, once you get into your, uh, into your strategies uh, of social media, you know, you start act, how are you going to access, how are you going to engage, customize your audience, connect and collaborate. So that will be, let's say, your, let's say, core like strategies that you, that you can start utilizing, but there are many depending on, on uh, what, what's going to be on your, uh, on your analysis. So that was a short intro. Um, uh, I hope it was a clear and it could get very intense. Um, uh, but anyway, just keep in mind four things. Um, why, who, what, and how, you know, you, you just put it out everything. And if you use that, it will help you a lot to have a structure and, uh, yeah, you can contact me, uh, to go, let's say, to go through the full deck and then, uh, yeah. So I would uh, be opening now for questions and I'm going to yes. stop the sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Nelson. It was really great, great insight. So as I said before, uh, now I'm just going to as well use the time and just use three to five minutes. Um, so for the audience, get ready, write down some questions and uh, then we will go through the questions. OK, uh, Nelson, thank you once again. Now I will share shortly and I promise it's going to be shortly um, just some basic facts about uh, Founders Institute, since the session is being hosted by Founders Institute. So for those who don't know what Founders Institute is, uh, indeed, Founders Institute, FI, is the world's lar largest pre-seed accelerator. Uh, we are here um, representing the Frankfurt Rhein-Main uh, region in Germany, but indeed, FI has uh, local directors and local cohorts in more than 200 cities. Uh, Nelson is one of our 15,000 mentors. Um, it's a very powerful network that really, it's great to count on people like Nelson. Once again, thank you, Nelson. <laughs> and to the other 50,000 mentors that join, uh, we have had more uh, than 5,000 alumni or graduates as we call them that have been working with us for now uh creating something that is worth more than 30 billions in terms of uh value and for those who are in the this type of startup ecosystem um we don't see each other as, as competitors to other accelerators or other uh incubators indeed we see it as a very good way uh to have a usp as nelson said um in the ecosystem so we see the others like startup weekend from tech stars as more inspirational then we come and we take founders from zero to one and when they are ready they join other um, accelerators uh, so we really see ourselves as one piece of the global ecosystem uh, so as said we take the founders from zero to one from the idea to the seed stage and uh, well this has been proven for years now it works it's something very uh, systematic and very um, in a framework that is designed in this way in 14 weeks so each week we join and we cover one one part of the of the business um, for example i remember that uh, nelson joined already here in the week five, for example, last year for branding and design. I also think it joined um, for product development more um, in different sessions, also in idea review. So we go every week, we bring the mentors. Uh, we have 
um, tasks that the funders need to do around the topic, and they get obviously the support from the the mentors, the directors, the other cohort uh, um, founders that are joining. And on top, when they graduate, obviously, they get the alumni perks and as well the access to the founder labs so that they keep on getting support uh, from the team uh, and from the old Founders Institute ecosystem. These are some examples of startups that, um, that work with us and as well, as I said, some of our mentors uh, from the ecosystem, we always try to invite from different verticals, from fintech, edtech, um, so, so that we cover every uh, potential area of interest that is being worked. This is our team of directors. So I'm here, Pedro, Carolina is also here. I believe Brita and Quentin are also here. Uh, Eugenio nowadays is, is based in Silicon Valley, so quite close to the edge quarters. And Dimitris is part of the FI Oslo um, and is supporting us as well for the ed track, uh, ed tech, uh, track and language learning. These are some of the portfolio companies that we supported uh, already. So 12 graduates uh, in different fields here locally in, in Frankfurt. And yes, if you have any questions or you want to apply, this is the, uh, the best URL to join, fi.com slash apply slash Frankfurt. Uh, but this was just a small commercial because now we want to go back to what Nelson was presenting. And I hope that these five minutes gave you time to prepare some questions. And I would invite everyone to turn on the cameras and join the conversation. I see that Martin already wrote something. Martin, if you want, I think Carolina also enables you to, to ask the question if you want. But yes, I can uh, also thanks read Nelson. it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yep, thanks, Go Nelson. Hey, Martin. Um, you talked about how, hi, Nelson. Um, very nice to meet you. Same. You said strategic marketing lead. And, and can you give some insights on uh, how you help startups to get more strategic in their marketing? I found that a very interesting uh, insight. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, actually, if I go back to, 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 the, to the history, uh, uh, when Gillette uh, was a company that was like, everybody knows Gillette over hundred years. And then we were at a point that uh, the business was really uh, pretty much tanking down. We were in bad shape. And then there was a new CEO named called Jim Kiltz and he restructured everything. So. And that point was a complete change of cost saving, but also training the team. And that's when the moment that he actually flipped everything and a, a, a strategic, global strategic market became, let's say that the leading, having the leading role within the organization. And out of this came out the growth of Gillette, uh, Gillette Venus uh, or OB. So, and with the methodology that it was throughout the whole organization. So the key thing is, first of all, to have in the mindset and to, to actually accept because I, you, know, you can go through the research and, and prove that it's, that it's right to have, because if you have a product or a service, right, then you're gonna wanna sell it to somebody or to another human, right? So you need to know how to communicate it. And that is the key. And for startups, uh, the way that I help them is, uh, you know, either I, um, in Taiwan, I have to start that I work with the long-term or I do maybe get invited to, to workshops or some of them, uh, I don't know if anybody's here that, but they, they call me up and I spend like, you know, our coffee time and ask, answer the questions. Uh, like, like I said, again, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to share. So yeah, ring me out. Uh, we have COVID time. So I think sometimes we have a little spare time to share uh, and I can take you through specific questions that you may have and you tell me what you do and uh, I can give you some, some, yeah, some, some mentoring. Does that answer your question or Martin? I think yes, you just okay. replied, thanks. <laughs> uh, indeed, Nelson, I will use the opportunity and also ask one question uh, because, yeah, uh, when I gave the introdu introduction and also you showed on your PPT, you, you have been working with a lot of interesting startups like Brain Navi, like Breeze. Um, those are startups that are working with uh, very specific uh, products or services. Um, 
that have been designed, for example, either in Taiwan or Netherlands, but then you support them to scale globally. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, how do you support these companies or how can a startup really enter in this framework mindset of scaling their projects globally? And how do you do the marketing towards touching different regions? Because mm -hmm. that's what you are doing right now with uh, with this startup, uh, this new product that you, yeah. that you just launched, for example. Yes, 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 yes. Actually, you know, I'm going to show this here. It's just uh, the mindset and uh, and, and to, un to, to take these startups and it's so, especially for, let's say, Taiwanese companies, uh, they, they have a lot of high tech, they're very developed. They're really, I mean, I went through some uh, uh, keynotes here in Germany and in Taiwan talking about, you know, cancer IoT development. That's, wow, I mean, it's like really, but then they, 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 they need to wrap it up in the way that you, you could do it globally. And whenever we do uh, take any product, any service to a brand, to a globality, from day one, you need to think from a global perspective. Because if you're going to globalize it, you know, it cannot be too local unless you have a bakery. But if this bakery is going to be, let's say, world leading uh, German bakery, then, then it's a different story, right? They need to have some different certain parameters. So first of all, define, let's say, the target, who it is, which countries are going to go after. Normally, it's like, you know, either it's the Asia, Western world, so like the big buckets, you know. And then from there, you can start going deeper. You know, Italy is different than, 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 than Finland and so on. So uh, it varies, but it's, again, it's the mindset and making sure that you always keep the 30,000 feet and down and, and always think, you know, it, it's, it's a global perspective, then you always think, okay, what, what would that mean uh, to do this product, launch the product globally? Yeah, a bit difficult to say in one simple sentence, but it's actually the doing uh, that, that, it, that it needs. There's a lot of detail, a lot of detail. Okay, thank you, Nelson. There was here another question, and I'm just going to read it out loud because it was written by Petri uh, about if you can summarize the core benefit in the four boxes thinking that you were just showing for a startup entrepreneur. Yeah. Um, so the summary basically, you need this is like a bucket of process. First, you have to analyze, uh, analyze your situation, you know, with all the things you need to do. You define your target group. Who you're going to be talking and selling to? You define what what you have, what you don't, right? You need to define this, and then how you're going to do it. So it's like a thinking process that goes in a circle. Uh, you can just out of this keynote just take these four four buckets, and again so, uh, analyze who you're going to go after, what is your offering, and how you're going to do it, right? And within them, there's a lot of uh, let's, there's a lot of tools that that need to be done to to be able to achieve that. Petri, is this uh, clear? I guess it is. His mic is off. Okay. Um, indeed, when I introduced the session, I also uh, uh, said that, yeah, you were going to give some tips for the entrepreneurs uh, regarding what Fortune 100 are doing well. Uh, on the other side of the coin, um, oh, what yeah. do you think that uh, Fortune 100 companies can also take from the startup world. Would you yeah. like to just yes. say some words many. about it? Yeah, yeah, many actually, you know, uh, uh, of course you would wish to be able to be quick and fast and be able to move right and left, but it's nearly very, very difficult to do, but you, you, you do make the, get the curve and you usually have some, uh, uh, you, you do it right in long term. So there's the flexibility is one. I think that also the entrepreneurial spirit uh, in some companies, they do have uh, entrepreneurial spirit. For example, I, uh, uh, one of my clients, the Longi, and uh, they are very entrepreneurial. They are like, they, they're, they're, they're like startups within the big corporation. They, they do a lot of, not developing new products, but being very independent. That's also is another way a uh, success story. So again, basically uh, is they should learn about how to be flexible, uh, taking the risks. I mean, they could take more risks and normally you get a lot of no, 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 no from legal, no from this, no from there, no, you get a lot of no's. Uh, and that's something that I think startups, you know, like I said, failing is okay, you know, and the big ones failing is not so, not, not so okay. So I think that is something that they could learn. Uh, and again, it's the drive. I think that the, the drive of, of startups is, is amazing, it's very inspiring. And uh, in large corporates, it's, it's a system, right? 
And mid-sized companies, that's a different story. You know, in German, uh, geht nicht, die haben es gemacht, means like, you know, it doesn't work, we did it before, it doesn't work. So this, it's inflexibility of opening up to what's happening in, uh, nowadays in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the community. I think for this is for medium-sized companies that they could be looking at really opening up their eyes and see all this amazing stuff that startups are doing and they, have, they can actually help them to get a sustainable competitive advantage if they will open up a little bit more uh, and cooperate with, uh, with startups. Pedro. Well, um, I think I'm having some technical. Carolina, can you support me here? We can hear you now, Pedro. Uh, you can hear me. Okay, perfect. Okay, I'm sorry, Nelson. I missed the, the, the last part of your answer. Um, but, well, I don't want to mono monopolize, but I had here as well another question that I wanted to, to ask. Um, because I also asked this question last time to Thomas Erzberger, which is a very standard question, but uh, I think it's useful always to learn as well from mistakes. So is there any mistakes that you would highlight that people should try to avoid or that you have seen some entrepreneurs doing that you clearly would say, well, try to avoid doing these mistakes? Yes, do your homework. <laughs> do your homework. That, you cannot make that mistake and you gotta do your homework. If you do your homework, you make less mistakes. I just like at school, you know, if you do your homework, you, you, you'll get a get good grades, right? Same thing, yeah. That, that's gonna avoid you to make mistakes. Oh, Pedro's gone. I'm Carolina. Here. Yes, yeah. I'm here. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's a very good, um, good reminder because I'm also a founder of, uh, of a company with a team of now six. Um, I think my follow-up questions to what Pedro has asked is, you know, we, we take a lot of time to do the analysis, the research, do our homework. Um, I, as an individual, tend to overthink many things. So my question to you is how, where do we see the balance? You know, is there a specific sprint um, process we should look into so that we also don't do the overthinking and not act because that's even a worse or evil, I, I believe. Yes, yes, yes. Actually, you know, out of, out of the every analysis, you need to have like a, the back of an envelope, conclusion implication, because otherwise you're going to go crazy. And uh, the last slide I showed, which was the, uh, that one page of blueprint, Actually, that one page has everything you should have because you have your vision, your mission, your objectives uh, and numbers and then words. And then for that objective, you have your key strategies, let's say five strategies, not 10, not 20, five max. And then each strategy has its activation, uh, you know, measure and activation plan. For example, you're gonna do a promotion in, uh, in Thailand to convert whatever, right? Where is this fit, fitting into and what, what is it paying off to your mission or to your vision? That is something that, that you could use. Actually, that, <clears throat> that one pager, everybody should have a one, one of these blueprints in their wall, everybody. And that, that, that helps you. And again, from the analysis, back at the envelope, what, what's the nugget? Because again, you're right, you're gonna, you're gonna over, over analyze everything. But at the end, you have to have something very concrete, very concrete. Thanks. Oh, I, I took a, a make sure I took a screenshot. We're going to have our. I think we have more than more than five strategies right now. So probably it's good to rethink it, rethink the process. Yeah, yeah. Again, call me. You know, we could. We, I just could take a look at it. We we'll love it. I'll send you a template. You can just fill it out. Sounds good, Nelson. Appreciate it. And we could also share with those here uh, as well yeah. those who are interested. Yeah. If you guys, if you guys want, I have uh, I developed the uh, um, you know the framework questionnaire. It is in Google, and uh, I can send it out to everybody, and I can of course read you through that. And at the same time, you're gonna go through that uh, say thinking process of you know if you, the questions that you're gonna get asked, they're gonna make you think. Hmm, uh, am I having troubles with this uh, with this question? And should I go deep dive into this? Other ones are not normal, but I, I, I could do that. I mean, we can talk, uh, Pedro, and we can put up that, uh, that questionnaire that I developed for the framework, which is part of the tool, you know. And 
That will be great. Thank you very much. Mm, sure. All right. So we Perfect. got yes. So we have still 23 people on the on the call. So if someone has more questions, take the opportunity now. We planned the session for at least 10 minutes additionally. So use the time. And Ian says that she would also mm -hmm. like to have the the questionnaire or to share it. No? Yes. Yeah. Okay. We will share it. It, uh, it, it is the the framework, the basic framework, and the question. It gives you an idea. An idea. So let's see who. who um, maybe let me ask you questions. Uh, if you ra can you can you can, you can raise the hand, right? How many of you have worked in a in a in a Fortune one hundred company or not? Let's say in a big large corporation. Can you raise your hands? Mm -hmm. I know of some. Mm -hmm. Can they raise their hands? They can. Okay. We, have, we have two hands. <laughs> one, yes, one of I them. Uh, okay, okay. Let me see. Where do I see the hands? If you oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah. And from those, which one were a global, um, global strategy, a global F Fortune one hundred? Raise your hands. Okay, so you can, you can feel that what, I, what I'm saying uh, a little bit. Then I, ask, I want to know more, more about you guys because I was actually going to ask in the beginning. So can you raise your hands now? Uh, the, the, if you have a startup, if, which stage are you in? Either the proof of uh, concept, proof of business or, or, or scalability. Raise your hands if you are in the uh, proof of concept stage. Proof of concept, okay. Uh, let me see. Proof of concept. But what? Who? How many are you? And the proof of business stage. Okay. Proof of business. Kerwin. Hi, Kerwin. Holland. Uh, what about scalability stage? You you scaling now. You scaling. Now you're good. Who's scaling up? Martin scaling up, Britta, Ying Tzu also, Kerwin also scaling up, true. Like, by the way, Kerwin, uh, he visited me, he's from uh, Breeze Suvius, the, uh, the new product we're gonna launch. Yeah, I'll send it out, You're gonna, you guys are gonna like that. Do you have it handy, somewhere in your table? <laughs> yes. You can I, just show it. Uh, actually, it's in here. I'll tell you what it is. It's um, it's a air and surface sanitizer. It um, what it, it's inside. Uh, it's uh, it's an aqua technology where basically it's a UV VUV light and inside with a as a photocatalytic system. So basically you cannot see the light inside, but it's fully protected by the aluminum. Basically it, it eliminates virus, bacteria, and fungus, right? And, and also eliminates through the, uh, the, the the air surface. Around you and, and on the surface because of the EFA. Okay, so yeah, it's a very small one. We are we're gonna do the crowdfunding. Uh, hopefully in the next few, uh, few few days. You know, you have a battery pack. You can take it out to go. And also we have a you know I have a table stand that you can put it on. And uh, well, it's taking two minutes, but it's uh, yeah you can put it on the table and um, yeah and then and have your safe air to go. You can just very be safe because especially pandemic. Yeah, it goes like that. And it has a shield. Okay, maybe perfect perfect design. Design. indeed, I will take it from this, this, this uh, example. Do you think that some startups and even corporates did, yeah, catch the moment that we are living it, living the Corona times and uh, yeah, adapted to this reality or launch new products or new service really designed to solve the, this situation. Um, you have been working with some of them. Yes. Um, but in general, uh, what is your feeling that uh, 
regarding this uh, this of well you can see it as an opportunity so people that <laughs> design solutions and products to solve this situation um, most of them had some success yes it's you know on one hand on one uh, one hand with with subius we we have a a drawback that you know we're not big enough you know a startup right and to be able to have the whole chain of uh, of teams that are going to go run and do it but on the other hand you know we're quick enough to be able to develop it because it's developed within uh let's say eight months because technology was there before because of COVID, we kicked it off let's say until the first prototype came in about it's in about a year which in a big one will take longer so yeah it's it depends you know a lot of corporations mid-size they went out, for example, air purifiers and in Germany or in Europe, they go all to China, buy it, wrap it up and sell it. That's something that, you know, for a startup, very difficult to do. You want to scale up, you have the product and solution, but you don't have the channels. You know, you don't have the funding to go to do all the uh, social media campaign to be able to promote this. So, yeah, th those are the... Uh, a combination of both, of course, is ideal, right? If you have a, a mid-size or big corporate that... Uh, that incubates you and let you do, let you do it and gives you the funding and the channels. And this could be a rocket. I mean, this this thing is uh, you know if you look from the from the design aspect and the usability and you can take it everywhere. You can hang it and uh, you know you can put it in your also for for because it kills uh, fungus. So if you hang it in your closet, uh, it it gets rid of the smell. So the smell is like it neutralizes the smell because it destroys the uh, fungus. So that's a secondary benefit. Right now, we're focusing more on the uh, you know safe air to go. Is there a link we can uh, provide here so that people can find out more? You're putting, you're putting pressure on me, Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's the way we need to inspire each other with our creative products. And I love yes. this. I know that. I know. I know. So we are um, we are actually doing right now. You know, we were hopefully. Uh, you can go to suvios.com, suvios.com, and you will find, let's say, the other air purifiers. Uh, and uh, there's only uh, coming soon. I can type it up here. www.su. And this is also another example of um, this brand we just came up with. You know, the meaning behind the brand and the strategy, how to come up with a name. Because uh, we all, normally we had breeze, and breeze is like breeze, you know, and the, it, it can be challenging. It's very, very descriptive. But we wanted to have another brand that is higher level that you can take more. And su actually means under, deep, and views in Dutch means forever succeeding. You know, so there's a meaning behind this. And, and with this brand, we can actually take into uh, also air purification, we can do light. You know, uh, because of light hormone changes, uh, uh, we can do water. We can do things that are, that that go into that uh, bigger umbrella. So that's part, let's say, of an example of um, you know doing the homework, right? And understanding why do you do that, and why do you come up with a name like that, and you know, why didn't you call it K25 or whatever, you know? And uh, also, tip for everybody: if you're working on a trademark. Uh, if you come up with a trademark that is very semi-descriptive, meaning close to what, it, what the meaning of it is, what the benefit is, good luck. Good luck, you may not get it. So my suggestion is to go non-descriptive. You know, Apple, if, what it's got to do with, uh, with computers, nothing. So uh, best is and the, the higher chance to get a trademark uh, is to do non-descriptive. Also, um, there are many brands that, have, that are being challenged by global if Fortune 100 company. So if you have your brand and uh, it's close to, let's say, to any big one, if they want to get rid of it, although you got it, they'll take it away from you. So that is uh, advice I can give you. If you are using a brand name, be careful with it. Be careful. I mean, the lawyers know about that, you know, but uh, it's, 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 very, it's a risky thing because you build a lot on it. But all of a sudden, you're not allowed to use it anymore. It happened to me. My company name was called Brandheim, Brand Home. It was trademarked, approved two days before the approval, and I had some lawyers coming out from Belgium that are trademarked uh, of an agency called uh, Brand Home in English. Yeah, I had to get up. So it happened to me. 
you know, although you get the okay, that doesn't mean you got it. Is there a, is there a, a, a place we could check for global trademarks? Or yes, yes, uh, you could, there's also some, I can send some links, uh, but it's not safe. You could do it yourself, but it's not safe. You okay. have to go through a trademark lawyer. That's the best thing. Okay. But my suggestion, especially being a startup, being a non-descriptive, call it a fantasy name. Yeah, because it's going to build on it. You know, it's going to build within, if you start talking to consumers, you're gonna, you don't want to know what, it's, what, what it is. If it's about bread, then you're going to call it, I don't know, Josie. You can somehow, at one point, there's going to be a link to Josie and the bread. Although in the beginning, it says, what has it got to do with that, you know? It, it's something that we need to consider. Makes sense. There's also a question from uh, Ing. Feel free to unmute if you like. Uh, if not, I'm just going to read it out. How do you decide which channels to sell the product? For example, do you choose a platform or do you go via distributors? Oh yeah, yeah. This is oh, that's another. This is another big topic, right? So. Uh, traditionally, for let's say smaller companies, you you know develop your product, and then you want to find distributors. And when I hear that, I, I always get like, oh, I get the shivers a little bit because I've had a lot of experience having your baby. Actually, you're going to give out your baby to a distributor, and you find somebody who's going to grab it and take it and sell it for you. And that distributor, he has many other things, and he's opportunistic. He's not going to love and be engaged with your baby unless he makes money. If he makes money, great. If, if not, then he's gonna drop it off. So the chance that they get dropped off is quite high. If you work with distributors, you need, you need to pick the right one. Even if it, they're huge, they may not be the right one. You need to find somebody that's really committed uh, to your product. Uh, and then you also have to give them guidance how to do the communication, how to take care of your baby. That is for distributors. And in terms of channels, uh, in the uh, and in, in the what uh, there's a part where you look at the four piece, you know the product price payment promotion and the placement part. Then you need to define who's your target, where are they buying, why they're buying, where is your competition. For example, if you are selling uh, the example of uh, chewing gums, let's say, okay, let's take that example. Normally, you would sell in the candy stores, right? And then at one point, uh, the, 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 the company said, hmm, what can I, can I extend my, my, my channel? Well, let me go to, to gas stations. Maybe in the gas stations, the good old days, only sold gas. So you need to think about alternative channels. How are you going to be distributed? Um, and uh, in case of, uh, let's say, um, online, you know, Amazon is this good, good and bad. I mean, both. Uh, but it depends on your target, depends on your product, depends on your competition. Uh, where to decide what channels you're going to be. Yeah. And also what your roll-up plan will be. If you go through distributors, uh, which ones and what regions and why. Yeah, that, that's very critical. Did I answer your question? Raise the hand. <laughs> I think I did. I think so, yes. I, okay. And uh, Nelson, we are getting closer to one. So <laughs> it's indeed the time frame that we uh, agreed upon. Um, mm -hmm. So I would like to give the opportunity, if there is someone else that has questions, to Nelson, do it now. If not, I will reply to Christina's question because she just wrote, wrote down a question that I think it's more directed to us, Founders Institute. Um, and I will reply very easily. So in the case uh, that um, Christina is... Um, describing is exactly the right case to join Founders Institute, which is when you still have an idea uh, and you are not yet far enough or too developed, because indeed we believe in the ideas and shaping uh, from zero to one. And it's exactly the phase that you are in, Christina. So I believe it's um, the exact right moment to, to join Founders Institute, because when you are already too advanced, uh, we also support this, uh, but then, yeah, the consequences of changing all the work that you did um, may be more painful for you, uh, because then the idea is really to go through everything that you already have done and maybe pivoting your idea, your service, um, but it's not 
impossible. There are we have been supporting people uh, just with an idea, but as well people with uh, with something that it's more developed. Um, yes. No? Okay. Actually, okay, thank you. Grow, I, I, sorry, sorry, because I, I, I've seen them uh, grow from day one to the last pitch. It was like so nice to see them, you know, like they grew amazingly and it was, uh, it was a good experience to see them, right? And then some of them, they changed. Some of them, they, when, they, when they pitched, their pitch was like great. Yeah, so it's a, from zero to one, I think that's well said. It's, 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 a, it's a good place. It's tough, it's not, it's not a game. So there's going to be a lot of homework being done there. Okay, thank you, Christina. And Carolina already wrote our contacts anyway, so you can drop us a line and we can take it offline. Uh, to, to just wrap up the session, Nelson, once again, thank you for joining and sharing all okay. of your knowledge. Uh, Nelson is one of the most engaged mentors that we have, as I said. Uh, already I think he's very open for networking so feel free to reach out to to Nelson um, regarding FI if you want to to or if you have any questions write it down to me Carolina Brita or the other directors that I just shown on the presentation and from our side um, the next lunch time series is going to be in August so in one month uh, it's always the first Thursday of the month, so it's going to be on the 5th of August. Uh, the topic, we are still uh, agreeing on the topic. I think we will invite one of our grads to come and showcase his journey and how we managed to not only launch the service, but as well get a grant. Uh, so it's also about how to get a bit of funding and which funding resources you can use. Uh, but yeah, we will disclose it on our social media channels soon. Um, so stay tuned to that. Regarding our third cohort, we are still, uh, we still have time uh, because it only starts in fall. Uh, but nevertheless, um, I would say that, yeah, follow our channels uh, if you have questions. Um, reach out to us and hopefully we see each other soon and um, eventually uh, on an offline event. Let's see. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you everyone. And uh, you can help us once we launch this uh, to like or share it. Okay. Definitely. Thanks Nelson. Thank Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Have questions uh, as well. Have a good rest of the week.